Good morning, everybody. I see um, everyone's starting to arrive now. Um, so I, on behalf of UCD Smurfit Executive Development, I'm delighted to welcome you here this morning to our Becoming a Better Negotiator webinar. I'm going to be back with you at the end of the webinar uh, to discuss our upcoming winning negotiation strategies course and also to put some of your questions to Stephen. So please do include them in the chat throughout the webinar and we'll try and get to as many as possible. Um, I'm delighted to be joined here this morning by Stephen Boyle, who is Programme Director of Winning Negotiation Strategies, as well as our Diploma in Advanced Management Performance. Um, he also works on a lot of our customised uh, programmes with clients. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Stephen. And as I said, I'll see you again at the end of the webinar. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Maria. And good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be with you this morning because this is a subject I'm very passionate, passionate about. I have worked in negotiation, lecturing, training and consulting for over 20 years now, and it still fascinates me. I love it. And I'm always learning something about how people can become better negotiators. And believe me, there is plenty of scope for all of us to become better negotiators. Studies suggest that 96% of negotiators are leaving value on the table. I disagree. My personal experience is that I see 100% of negotiators leaving value on the table. Um, let me give you a, a typical example. Um, two weeks ago, I was working with a group of 120 salespeople over a couple of workshops, and they went through a relatively simple negotiation exercise with the potential to create value, to gain value by finding the right deal in a negotiation that involved just five issues to be agreed. They had about 30 minutes to negotiate. 100% left value on the table. How much value did they leave on the table? The typical outcome was that there was room for a 45% increase in the value that they gained. Okay, so what do I mean by leaving value on the table in a negotiation? Well, leaving value on the table in a negotiation goes back to an idea that we can create value in negotiations. Not all, but almost all negotiations offer the opportunity to create value. And it's typically there that we have the best opportunity to become better at negotiating. So a typical negotiation might go like this. Somebody is, they're selling something. I'll use an example of an MBA student a couple of years ago who approached me. They were selling a chunk of their business. And the question was, how much money do they get? Now, if the negotiation is purely about what price do they sell this share of their business for, they can't create value. They can only maybe capture a slice of it. Any gain to them is a, a cost to the buyer. The business doesn't change and they get more money. Or if they get less than they were hoping, it's a loss to them and a win to the other side. And so we have this idea of win-lose. We can also look at it as the pie of negotiation, the pie that's being divided is fixed. But suppose they think about ways to create value. Suppose they think about what they want and what the buyer wants. Let's say that the buyer is trying to keep the price down because they've got a certain treasure chest for buying up section pieces of businesses that they're interested in. So their immediate cash flow is limited. Now, let's suppose that the, the this MBA student is interested in, in money, but the timing of the money isn't such a concern. What about a payment now? But it's like a down payment and installments pay, payments later that perhaps add up to far more than they could have got limited by how much the buyer can afford to pay right now. What if we took that idea a step further and add in an, added in another element? And let's say we make those payments dependent, contingent on something that may be of value to the buyer. Let's suppose that for the first year or so, the student remains involved in the business in some advisory capacity, okay? Further inflating the payment, but also adding value for the buyer. Let's suppose, we add more, like we think about how the, the student is convinced that there's upside potential in the business that isn't, isn't really reflected in the buyer's valuation. 
So they're contingent payments on future performance of the business, maybe in the first two or three years and so on. And so far, we haven't got away from any issue other than how much money it is, but we've split that issue. So value can be created. Okay, so value can be created, but unfortunately, the vast majority of negotiators are not doing a good job of creating value. Okay, so why is that? What's going wrong? Um, well, there can be a whole variety of, of problems that are getting in the way of being better negotiators, but I like to lump them into a few areas. And I'm going to explore some of those areas with you. And then a little later, I'll explain what we can do to move beyond these problems and become better negotiators and how I help people to do that in the Winning Negotiation Strategies program. Okay, so the first thing that's going wrong is, is uh, the way we learn to negotiate. And I'd like you to think for a moment about how you learned to negotiate. Um, what kind of experience was it? Was it a formal learning experience or an informal learning experience? Was it specific to a job you were doing? When did you start to learn to negotiate? Okay, so you've thought about that for a moment. Most people, you're probably thinking, well, I learned through largely informal learning, right? Trial and error. Maybe a few of you have been to negotiation courses, but I would say that's a minority. Um, you may also have learned with some guidance from others, right? But they learned in the same way as you. And the learning process probably started when you were a tiny little kid, right? If you've got children, you realize that children of all ages negotiate a lot, right? When they're tiny kids, they negotiate about their bedtime or sweeties or toys. As they get a bit older, the toys get more expensive. It's video consoles, um, game consoles. I mean, you know, mobile phones, that kind of stuff. Bedtime becomes curfew. Can I go to this party, this disco and so on? As they're teenagers and young adults, it becomes more about money, right? Or use of the car or that kind of stuff, right? And, and that applies to all of us. We may not have negotiated about all those things, but we negotiated about some of those. Right. So that's how we learn. And if you think about it, it means we're negotiating all the time. Think about the types of situations in which you negotiate. So that's one example. But if you don't have kids, um, you almost certainly, it's almost certain that all of you or well, most of you uh, don't live on your own. You share a, an accommodation either with a partner or with some friends, or with some students. Or if you don't do that, you work with other people. In other words, unless you're a total hermit, you interact with other people and you negotiate with them at some level. And if you've got friends, which I hope you do, you negotiate with your friends. You just don't call it negotiation, okay? So you're negotiating all the time and you're learning to negotiate on the basis of the feedback that you get. But there's a big problem. There's a big limitation in that learning process because the feedback is highly limited. No parent ever tells their kids how they could get more sweets or more money or the more expensive phone through better negotiation skills, right? So we're not getting that feedback. And now as an adult, if you're going out to buy a car, no car dealer ever tells you how you could have got more money off. So our reflections are very, very limited, right? We're relying on our own thoughts, our own worldview, which is kind of, we term this egocentrism, right? Uh, we are the center of the experience and we're not seeing the situation in whole or the situation from the other side's perspective as well. So our learning is seriously flawed and we're likely to keep on negotiating therefore in the same way, right? Okay. Um, and that's all right if we're negotiating in the right way. But the problem is that there are probably two, we could say there's two dominant approaches or models to negotiation, both of which are wrong. Now, I'm gonna explore those in a little bit more detail with you in a few minutes. But essentially, people tend to see negotiation as either a relatively competitive process in which it's a battle, you're vying, against, you're vying against the other side to get what you want, right? That That's how that 
MBA student initially saw the negotiation over the sale of, uh, of, of the business, that he's vying to get the price that he wants and the buyer is vying to keep that price down low. Okay, that's one model. The other model, well, I'd like you to reflect on, on your style of negotiation and ask yourself, are you the kind of person who vies, who's assertive, who's competitive? Or are you the opposite? Are you a peacemaker? Are you somebody who likes just to be cooperative? Because that model is very, very widespread as well. Let's say the cooperative approach. Um, the idea that, you know, be nice, be warm, be friendly, all of which, by the way, can have a role to play in good negotiation, but on their own, they're not strategies. And that's a flawed model. We could effectively say the soft approach versus the hard approach. And neither of these approaches is very effective. I'm going to go a little bit later into just a little bit more insight in, as to why that's a problem. And then a further problem I want to explore with you, and I'm going to give you some tips on how to get this right, is the lack of preparation that people put into negotiations. Okay, so one of these, these, these issues that's leading to a lack of value creation is not really being well prepared. So that MBA student could walk right into the negotiation, maybe having researched the buyer quite a bit as a person, as an individual, or as a company, but not really doing the right preparation for negotiating. Like for example, exploring various interests, not just on the buyer's side, but on their own side, exploring the structure of the situation as well. And centrally exploring their own plan, their own needs, their own priorities, trade-offs, and alternatives that they may have. So we'll explore those ideas in a little bit more detail also. Okay. Um, so these are some of the problems that, that hinder people from being better negotiators. And to get past these problems, first of all, we need to get a better concept of what's a good model of negotiation. And to get a better model of what's a good negotiation, um, a good approach to negotiation, it's helpful if we explore, well, what's wrong with the models that I, that I mentioned already, okay? So we could characterize those models um, just even graphically like this. We're either vying, we're very competitive, or we're shaking hands, we're trying to be very cooperative, okay? Um, and neither of those models is an ideal approach to negotiation, okay? So let's see what's wrong with these models. Um, and I, I see there's a couple of comments starting to come in in the chat, so do feel free to pose some questions because I'm going to leave plenty of time later to explore some questions that may arise. So if you've got questions that come up, please add them in. Okay, right of all, uh, right, first of all, let's explore the, the tough approach to negotiation. I think that probably this is one, it's a bit harder for people to see or to accept that this is a deeply flawed approach to negotiation. I, I could reassure you that academic research, research demonstrates, research into real negotiation outcomes demonstrates the tough, aggressive, competitive negotiators don't perform as well, even, uh, even as well as cooperative negotiators and certainly not as well as skilled negotiators who know how to create value, okay? Um, I could tell you that, but, you know, academic research doesn't always persuade people. So I want to get into some of the real reasons why the tough approach is flawed. Why is a too competitive approach flawed? Well, first of all, you know, let me, let me give you an example. It's a thinly disguised example. Um, I'm not gonna tell you what it's really about, but, um, a company, a well-known company, negotiates with a key supplier by pitching it against another competing supplier. The negotiation is pretty bloody and aggressive, okay? Towards the end of the negotiation, they lead the second supplier to believe that they're going to get the contract, let the first supplier know that, and the first supplier panics, cuts their price one last time, and does the deal. And it's hailed as a great deal. But the problem is it's not a great deal. For starters, it's potentially not a great deal because if that supplier who signed the contract feeling forced into it and feeling tricked because they found out later that they were tricked, if they, if they feel that way, during the implementation of that contract, they're likely to try and get revenge. 
But the real problems will likely arise later if the company needs that contractor, needs that supplier again, which it turned out they did. And now the supplier who had been, let's say, the, um, the fall guy, the victim of uh, the pretense that they would win the contract, they did not want to do a deal at all in the future. And they said, we're walking away from any future business with you. So now the company is left with only one option. That happened 20 years ago. And 20 years on, they are still having problems dealing with that supplier and getting the prices and, and the, the, the stuff that they need. Okay, that's not just one example. It underpins a few problems with the, the tough, flawed approach. The most obvious one is, is you alienate others, okay? And alienating others has a number of problems, okay? You reduce your options. You make people close down their willingness or ability to work with you. And so the, the size of the pie actually shrinks. If the other side gains more power or creates more power for themselves, you put yourself at a disadvantage. But also, simply put, even in a one-off negotiation, alienating people gets their backs up and they may start to make irrational decisions. They may walk away from a deal that you think they should do and that perhaps objectively they should do because you've made them feel bad. You've hurt their pride. You've wounded their emotions. Okay. There are other reasons as well why that highly competitive approach uh, is, is flawed. Um, the underlying process focuses only on my side of the pie. In that little example I gave you with the, the MBA student, the MBA student started to think about the other side's needs. Like let's say the timing of their payments, right? Like how much cash do they have now versus ongoing cash flow later? which actually unlocks potential value for the seller, right? So if we fail to think about the other side's needs, which is exactly what the tough negotiator does, we actually neglect our own. Okay, so what's wrong with the smile and the warm handshake then, the soft approach to negotiating? Well, I think that this is easier to see, partly because, you know, the media tends to promote and laud that, that really tough, aggressive style of negotiation. Um, people don't easily understand what's wrong with that. So, you know, we see on, say, programs like Dragon's Den, that's probably the dominant style of negotiation, the aggressive style. People think it's pretty good. The company I just alluded to, with the thinly disguised example, um, I was before I went, came on the webinar, I was just looking up the latest news about these failed negotiations that they're having. And I looked in various really respected news outlets. Nobody was really spotting the flaws in the approach, the critical, the critical um, weakness in the approach. They're just reporting as is with maybe a slight bias to saying, wow, these guys are really tough negotiators, but they're not able to do business and they're not able to buy something that the company needs on an ongoing basis. Right. Which is, you know, strange that people can't see this. And that's because this widespread flawed model of negotiation is, is quite, you know, it's generally accepted. The soft approach is probably less accepted as a good approach. Um, but very often the, the concept of win-win negotiation is mistakenly believed to be a soft approach. That it's about, well, if you're warm, if you're nice to people, um, if you have a win-win mentality, it will work. But unfortunately, that's not a strategy. Sometimes people believe that they should set aside and neglect their own interests in order to buy the relationship. So in other words, at the heart of this is it's recognizing that the relationship is important, but then seeing that there's a feeling that there's a dilemma that, well, to protect that relationship, I can't go too hard on my interests. Okay, so that's, that's a bit of a problem. Okay, and to get beyond that problem, we need to have a better model of negotiation. But that model actually begins with being well prepared for negotiations. And the lack of preparation or the wrong kind of preparation is also a contributor to people leaving value out and not getting as good a deal as they could. Okay, so I just want to explore some ideas and give you some tips about what good preparation looks like for negotiation. Um, well, good preparation means having a plan. And the first part of the plan is your side of the plan. So this is about what you want. There's absolutely nothing wrong. In fact, there's everything right 
about starting a preparation with figuring out what you want. But when you figure out what you want, you need to get behind just what you say you want or what you think you want and recognize what's really important to you. Let me illustrate with a little example we'll all be familiar with. Um, this time last year, here in Ireland and in many other parts of the world, um, vaccination programs against COVID were finally being rolled out. But there was deep frustration right across the European Union, not just in this country, there was deep frustration with the lack of vaccines, how slow it was to get these vaccines out, how the weekly numbers were just not enough. And there was talk about ramping up, but we started to realize there were supply issues, supply issues that not everyone was experiencing. The UK was not experiencing those issues. And in the early months of vaccination, which were the most crucial months, their supply of vaccines and their rollout was soaring ahead of other countries in Europe. The reason was that, or a core reason was, that the negotiators for the European Union who bought the vaccines did not focus sufficiently on what their interests were. And they focused on a goal of getting a good price, as reported in the media, versus actually getting the vaccines, whatever the price, which would be offset anyway by the savings, the savings of lives, the saving of healthcare costs, the reopening of economies. Okay, so make sure you've got a good plan. And when there's more than one issue, and there should always be, you should always be searching for other issues or ways to break up the issues, like I gave in that example with the student selling the business, you should also be thinking about, um, well, what are my priorities across those issues? How could I trade with those issues? And this is moving towards a better model of negotiation, where you're going to trade rather than to vie or to fight or to give in. Another part of planning is, of course, thinking about the other side, but you need to go beyond this idea that we think about what's their psychology, what kind of people are they, what kind of company is it, what's their history. The people are important, but in particular, we want to think about the different stakeholders, if there's more than one stakeholder, and what the decision process is. But we need, also need to go beyond that and actually think reflexively about them in the way we thought about ourselves. So. What do we think their goals are and their underlying interests? What kind of priorities do they have? What trade-offs? Why are they really doing this? Do they have particular problems? Do they have advantages? Okay. And something that applies to both us and them, which is part of assessing the situation, is what's the balance of power and that how will that affect the rules of the game? And if we start to see that the balance of power isn't in our favor, we need to go back to our plan before we start negotiating and see what we can do to improve that balance of power. One of the best things we can do is generate more alternatives for ourselves. So one of the best things that that MBA student can do is find alternative possible buyers. At least assess if there's none now, is it likely there'll be some in the future? How could those options be generated? There are other rules of the game or situational factors to take into account. Um, when I gave that thinly disguised example of the company um, dealing with its suppliers, one thing that they really neglected to think about sufficiently was, is this a repetitive game? Are we going to be playing this game again with the same people in the future? Because if you are, you better think about the impact of your behavior now, as opposed to seeing it as a one-off winner-takes-all situation in which there are no consequences for your behavior now. If it's a repetitive game, our behavior now brings consequences into the future, which is why they're still having problems 20 years later. Okay, what about other factors? Is there time pressure? Are there time-related costs? Does the deal have to be ratified on your side or on the other side or both? Are there cross-cultural factors? So there's a lot of things to think about um, when we're preparing for a negotiation. Okay, so how do we get better at negotiation? Well, I want to answer this question very briefly, generally, and then through the lens of specifically, what do I cover, what do we do in the winning negotiation strategies course? Okay, so for starters, one way to get better about, at negotiation is, is to actually you know, read some good material about it. So read some good principles um, in, in negotiation, right? That's something, but that's, quite limited for most people. I observe, for example, that when, when I have students who are taking, let's say, a 12-week course in negotiation, where they've got one lecture a week, 
even though we've had a lecture on something like how to prepare and they read about it, when it comes to putting that into practice, they don't really implement it effectively. In other words, knowing isn't, it's not even half the battle, right? <laughs> because we actually are, have a tendency to keep doing what we always do or believing what we always believe, regardless of having read some interesting theory or idea. The theories and ideas in negotiation, by the way, are very, very solid. Most of the books I have on my shelf about negotiation have some good advice to offer, although you'll also find some books that I think have some flawed advice. Um, but that's not enough. So practice also helps, and practice coupled with the right kind of reflection. The best way to reflect is to have a good plan, right? So we, we need to go beyond understanding what to do. We need to observe what we're actually doing, seeing are we doing the right things, what are others doing, and reflect. And then we also need to know, you know, when we think about what's the right thing to do, what's the right thing to do in this context? So this comes partly back to our planning. What's the situation? What are the rules of the game? Have we picked out the right strategies? Okay, so let me say a few words about, um, wrap up by saying a few words about how I address these issues in the Winning Negotiation Strategies Program. And then I'd be very happy to, to um, take questions or comments. Okay, so um, in this program, what I like to do is, I like to actually give people an, a structured method for negotiating because that's really at the heart of getting better. It's, it's knowing that you have a process when you negotiate, that there's steps you go through and that you understand the game, right? And the steps, there aren't many of them. The process is pretty clear. The next thing is to provide practice and discussion and feedback. And you get something you just can't get in your day-to-day -day negotiations. You get the opportunity to get insights into what the results were from the other side's perspective and what other people doing the same thing, what did they get? What worked for them? What didn't work for them? And this can pr produce a huge influx of, of insights and realizations about the way we negotiate and the way we should negotiate. And we link that then to what are the right strategies for the right situations? Because there are a few different types of negotiation situation and we need to make sure that we apply the right strategies to each one. Finally, a very important point that I want to highlight is that our ability to execute a plan or to execute these strategies at the table is linked to our own tendencies, our own personality. People didn't become tough negotiators or soft negotiators or some other kind of negotiator just because they watched Dragon's Den or they were told to do it this way or that way. Our approach to negotiation, which we learned from a very young age, is inextricably linked to our personalities. So personal insight is a very important part of learning to become better negotiators, understanding our personalities, our cultural tendencies that lead us to behave in a certain way, that lead us to see what are our strengths, but also perhaps what are our limitations. We don't have to change our personalities or our cultural viewpoints or, or traits to become better negotiators. But what we do need to do is to understand them, how they might impact on a negotiation, and then at times to understand what interventions, what tactics can we use to change our behaviors, to tweak our behaviors so that they don't become a disadvantage, a burden to us? Okay, so that personal insight and development is a part of the program. And actually, I make sure that personal action planning is also a part of the program. So at the end of the three days, we spend a little, little time reflecting and action planning. So you get a chance to put the negotiation strategies and skills into real action plans for what you can immediately do. Because to become a better negotiator, you've got to change, right? You've got to change your behavior. And it's best to see, well, specifically what you're going to do. And I make sure that I'm available to you over that period to give you some comments, some insights, some ideas, and to take questions. And actually throughout the three days, I like to, to take questions and get questions about uh, about your real negotiation challenges and problems. 
because that's how real learning begins and people become better at negotiating. Um, so with that in mind, um, let me just take a quick look in the chat. I see that um, there are some questions um, coming in there. Um, Trevor has asked, could I mention a couple of, of texts? Um, so, sure, and I'll tell you what I could do. I could just type in the names of a few texts into the chat so that everyone can see them, okay? One that a lot of my students are, um, are liking at the moment, and I think it's largely good. There'd probably a few, be a, a few bits of advice in the, where I'd, I'd be somewhat at odds with the author, but generally uh, it's an enjoyable text. And I think it gets people thinking about negotiation is never split the difference by a guy called Chris Voss, who's um, a former crack FBI negotiator. And the book is very entertaining as well as having some good ideas. Um, a, uh, but one of the problems I think is it doesn't give us enough insight into really a good structure. And you'll get that approach if you read a book that's maybe a little bit drier, but um, I would say uh, certainly um, uh, stronger um, overall. Um, negotiating rashly by, if I recall correctly, the authors are Bazerman and others. Um, and then um, for the real heavyweights who really want um, a tome on negotiation, um, my favorite, my all-time favorite, it's really actually a, an MBA level kind of textbook. And it's one I use in all my, all my formal accredited courses, but it's not a requirement for winning negotiation strategies, but it's something I recommend. Um, the Mind and Heart of the Negotiator by Lee Thompson. Um, so I see a few people have asked um, uh, uh, some similar questions around that. Um, uh, there, uh, Gabia was asking about um, the, uh, how the winning negotiations program is structured. And uh, I, I know you said I've answered your question, but I could actually say just a little bit more about that. So we take on day one, um, we get into the core of what good negotiation strategy and planning means. And on the second day, we get into um, exploring how do we actually implement that strategy? How do we make that work for us? And on the third day, we come across, well, how do we deal with the biggest crunches and challenges in negotiation, including dealing with conflict and emotions? And I see actually a question just on that point, a question just popped up there from Brian. Um, uh, how do you remove emotion from the negotiation? So we remove emotion from the negotiation, I guess by, um, um, well, you can't, you can't really remove negotiation, emotion from the negotiation, but you can deal with emotion in the negotiation. And emotion comes uh, in a two-sided negotiation. There's two sets of emotions. There's your emotion and their emotion. And there'd be no point in me telling you how to deal with other people's emotion if you're not going to deal with your own emotion. And that doesn't mean be unemotional, but this comes back to understanding ourselves. What triggers our emotions? Do we recognize that? Do we know when we're getting too emotional? Are we making rational decisions about, about negotiation? So we could say, are we in, in reasonable control of our emotions? And then are we thinking about the other side's emotion? Are we prompting them actually to make irrational decisions? Something that tough negotiators frequently do. They goad their opponents into walking away from deals, okay? That actually could be advantageous. Um, are we also dealing with things like anger and aggression well at the negotiation table? So we explore quite a few of these things in, in the program. Actually, that tends to come in in day three. We really get into the people and emotions and the psychology side of it. Um, Steve, another, from your experience, yeah. do you think um, that uh, aggressive negotiators think that they're good negotiators? Like, does it tend to be the passive nego negotiators that go on a course because they think they're not good at it, whereas aggressive negotiators feel like they're good negotiators? Um, I would say, yeah, to a certain extent, but I'd actually get quite a mix on, on, on courses, um, which is good for the participants to see mm -hmm. that uh, there'll always be some people who are if not, let's say, I wouldn't necessarily bare-faced aggression, but who are the tough negotiators who want to win it all, who have a very competitive mindset, okay? And I get this in all courses and it really helps to prompt um, more learning and more insight for, for, for everyone. But, you know, I, I think very often say from the perspective of maybe people who feel that they're softer negotiators 
they come because they feel, I think there's things I need to learn. But I think the people who are tougher negotiators come because they feel, I want to get more. <laughs> and, and they can really have some great insights about here's how you get more. And it's interesting because I know we get a lot of people from sales and I wonder because, because sales has moved from sort of selling products, a one-off deal to selling services and you want that client relationship management, to, has negotiation become more important? Um, I, I have to say, I think that, you know, negotiation is, uh, it never really goes away, but I suppose it has become more important. I mean, even if we think, you know, a, a lot of people are realizing now that there's more draws on their time, that they're just busier. And that's even that requires more negotiation because other people want you to do things and we're negotiating around that. Um, so uh, actually one of the questions that came up there was, could I give some real world situations where we could practice like in small everyday interactions? So I suppose I could say, well, think about small everyday interactions um, in which you're not going to necessarily offend your counterparts. Like they might be friends or family and then think about, well, how you could practice in those situations. Think about what are we actually negotiating about? And rather than just diving in straight away, take a few minutes to step back and prepare to think about, okay, so what does she want? And what do I want? And do we really have all of the issues on the table here? Are there other issues we can introduce? Could we divide this issue up? So of course, to practice, you want to have a bit of structure there to to uh, to build out the, the the skills and practicing on maybe doing a few things at a time like practicing on asking more questions or becoming a better listener could be part of that um, another question that came into uh, me uh, directly there was um, how many people attend the program and roughly what's the percentage of theory teaching versus practice and exercise okay so um Maria, you might have a good idea of how many people are we expecting to attend? Are we expecting to attend on this occasion? Would you say uh, it's between twenty and twenty-four normally? Yeah, that would be typical. Yeah, and um, so it's small enough. There's great opportunity for input, questions, discussion for everyone, and large enough that when we do some negotiations, we get lots of variety in the approaches and the results, and that really helps us to learn. Um, and. Another part of that question was the percentage of theory teaching versus practice exercise. I guess I'd say it's roughly half and half, okay? Um, so if we're not doing practice exercise, we're doing, a, we're, we're have, we have one pretty large case study that we also discuss, which I would put in the, in, in the category of practice and exercise, okay? Because I ask people to relate it to their views on negotiation and their experience. So it's probably about half and half. It, it's certainly a nice balance. Um, you know, participants seem to really like, e even people who feel, oh, I don't know if I like role play. Participants really get into it because you're not actually put up on a stage on a podium. You're not asked to sit down in the middle of the class with everyone in a semicircle watching you. Uh, actually, everyone goes off, breaks out, does their negotiation just in, typically I do them one-on-one -on -one and we come back and we discuss the process and the results. So there's a kind of a safety in it. Everyone's in the same boat. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things the participants, when they come on, so some of them might be lacking in confidence. And I guess doing the preparedness and having the plan helps you in negotiation and being more confident as well. Um, it certainly does. And confidence is a very important part of negotiation both in terms of your, your ability to pull it off, your ability to even just as much as say, ask for what it is that you want. Um, but it also actually plays an instrumental role in being powerful in negotiation uh, and increasing the perception of your power in negotiation. And that's something that participants can really get and also can learn about how to be more confident, how to actually make themselves feel more confident and more powerful. Um, I see another question that came up there was, um, James asked, would hiring a new employee be considered a repetitive game or a subsegment of a repetitive game? And absolutely, hiring an employee is, is most definitely, it's a repetitive negotiation. Because when we say repetitive game, what we mean is, are we going to be negotiating again in the future? So if you hire someone who's going to be working for you, you're absolutely going to be negotiating all the time. Okay, so we have to think about that. 
And do you find, Stephen, that um, people find it harder to negotiate for themselves uh, rather than their company, say, in, in, in getting a promotion or wage conversations? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this actually relates to a phenomenon which we probably explore in, in the module, you know, it's a question that often comes up in the program, um, that we quite often in negotiations, and this especially applies to people who think their style might be a little bit soft, we're a bit concerned about something called social backlash, which is basically that we're perceived to damage the relationship and the, we get a little bit of relationship backlash social backlash as psychologists call it and especially if we're negotiating about something that's for ourselves personally this may cause us to go softer than we normally would or even sometimes to avoid a negotiation because we're concerned too much about the social backlash um, there are tactics that we can use to overcome that now, generally having better confidence but specifically actually it, it's been demonstrated that if people go in with a mindset that although they're negotiating for something for themselves, go in imagining what would I do if I were negotiating this for someone else? Like let's say for my sister or my most valued employee or team member, how would I go about doing it? And that actually strengthens people's resolve and reduces that fear, that concern about the social backlash. Um, Let's see uh, what other questions are in there. Um, so Ronan asked uh, good resources to give more examples. Um, I, th I think any of those good books, th those books I mentioned, and there are others like the, the, the famous landmark uh, book, 1982, Getting to Yes, 1981, I think now, so over 40 years old, Getting to Yes by Fisher and Urey, which someone else mentioned in uh, uh, a bit earlier. Getting to Yes by Fisher and Urey is another one. Um, but actually, I would say any, uh, any of these, um, um, the, these texts that I've mentioned, you'll find examples in there. Um, and um, Trevor asked, um, does it, how does this program fit into wider programs? Um, no, it's, it's, not, it's not a program that's credited, um, that gives you a credit towards let's say one of our diploma programs or an MBA. This is a standalone three-day program. Effectively, it's there for people who really want to improve better their negotiation skills and better their outcomes. So um, the, only, uh, the only reward that you get out of this is, is uh, better results, better wealth, better happiness, okay? Which to my mind, that's plenty of reward. And um, Phelan asked, are there any other key pointers or pillars on developing the plan? Okay, I'd say kind of generally speaking, you have to come on the course. Okay, so, but I have given some tips here, like, you know, how you think about your goals, how you think about your priorities, um, have you thought about what your fallback position is, uh, and aspects of the other side of the situation, all of which we explore in a lot more detail and context in the, in the program. Um, and Ruth has asked, do we get a certificate of merit? Absolutely. There is a certificate of merit. There's a certificate of completion of the program, something that you can um, uh, frame and hang on your wall, um, but take it down when you're negotiating with someone. You don't necessarily want them to know just how good you are. Okay. Um, uh, Sylvain has asked, um, any um, insights in the course on negotiating with different cultural environments, businesses based in non-Western or English speaking countries like Japan, Asia, Eastern European, Eastern Europe, Latin America, France. And I would say, this is a topic that I usually do cover. I don't always cover it because I, I like actually to leave a little bit of room in the course for participants to talk about what's most relevant to them. And usually and increasingly people say, this is really relevant to us, okay? So um, I give some really solid guidance about what you can do. Um, so, uh, and then James asked, um, does the course go into different mediums of communication or negotiation? That again is something that can come up. And I think what James is probably referring to there is like, what if you're negotiating virtually or by email as opposed to face-to-face in-person negotiation? And that is something that, um, that we, you know, if, if the question arises, if people are doing a lot of that, it's something where we can actually absolutely give some pointers. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Maria now because Maria has, has um, a few more um, 
points to make about the, uh, the program. Um, so let me pass you over to Maria there and I'll just put the slides up there for you. Thanks, thanks Steve. Great. Um, if you can move on to the, the slide by the course, great. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so yeah, no, I'm just going to go through through some of the practicalities um, uh, about the course. So we've mentioned it throughout the webinar. So the, the next intake of winning negotiation strategies is starting on the 2nd of March. It's three consecutive days. So Wednesday to Friday. And um, you see the fees there are 2000 euros for the three days. And um, as we said earlier, it's 20 to 24 in the class. And you, you're, you will receive a certificate of completion after um, doing the three days. You can just move on, please, Stephen. Great, thanks. So I just put a few of um, the participants' objectives up on the screen there. Now, we're not going to go through all of them, but I think a lot of them came up today. I mean, things like becoming a more confident negotiator, better negotiation skills, negotiation tactics, all things that Stephen co covered today. Um, I, I think that um, one of the other things also that comes out is, it's interesting there you see the last point, it's gaining some new perspectives from the group. And I think Stephen will probably say himself in the class, you probably learn as much from each other as, as you do from the course, in the sense that you'll see lots of different types of negotiators, but you'll also see people from lots of different organizations and you'll understand how they handle their negotiations within their company. Um, so Stephen, if you move on to the next slide there, you'll see this is just a selection of some of the companies that have come on the course before. So you see a huge range, everything from public sector to the corporate sector, We've got pharmaceuticals, ICTs. And um, so it really does bring a wealth of knowledge into the classroom and um, leads to some very interesting discussions. I don't know, Stephen, if you want to speak a little bit about that, about the, the people within the classroom. Yeah, I mean, the, the variety but the variety here speaks for itself, but also behind this, we'll get people in, in sales roles, we'll get people in procurement roles. Um, so uh, that, that in itself can provide really interesting and entertaining insights for people, as well as very valuable insights. We get people who negotiate with regulars, people who are, sorry, with regulators, people who are concerned about internal negotiations within large organizations or small organizations that feel uh, like small businesses, for example, that feel, how do I negotiate? I've got very little power. Um, all of my customers or all of my suppliers, they're much, much bigger than I am. Um, and, and we deal with those kind of issues. And as Maria said, you learn a huge amount actually from each other, from the insights that you get and from seeing different perspectives on negotiation. And uh, I think finally, just to say, um, we because um, it always comes up, we are back on campus and that's our lovely campus in Black Rock there. So you'll be on campus with us in Black Rock for three days. And um, we've been back on campus since September. So it's great to be back to face to face teaching. And um, I think everyone enjoys sort of the networking at the coffee breaks and the lunch breaks. And um, yeah, it's nice to, to see uh, in person people again. Um, Stephen, you might, I, I don't know if you, have you been back in the classroom yet? Um, I have, we, we've been back in the classroom actually since, um, since September, uh, we've been, we've been back in. So our programs are running very, very smoothly. We've got great, extremely well ventilated classrooms with, um, CO2 monitoring and air filtration. Um, so, uh, we have a very safe environment. Um, and uh, and it, it's a really, really, truly enjoyable experience. And nothing beats that face-to-face -face experience, that in-person experience, uh, when we're when we want to learn about a subject like this. Great. And um, look, finally, I'm just going to say that, like, I'm going to be sending out an email to everyone today. So what I'll do is I'll include details about the uh, course, the Winning Negotiations course, so you can come back to me directly with any questions. I'll also include the list of books that Stephen mentioned today, just so you have them in, in writing. Um, and um, finally, just look, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, I can see we could see by the amount of registrations and the people who joined us this morning that this is uh, a subject matter that really resonates uh, with people. Also, there were plenty of questions, some of which I, I am not sure if we got to, but it just shows the engagement with Stephen's lecture today. So finally, just thank you, Stephen, uh, for uh, a really enlightening lecture and hopefully we'll see some of you at the course in a few weeks. Thanks so much, Stephen.